Thanks for joining us on this wonderful Mother's Day weekend. We exist for three purposes here at Family of Christ. It's to meet Jesus, make friends, and make a difference. We're jumping into the middle of a sermon series called Unmistakable. And today we're going to talk about the, the topic of unmistakable holiness based on 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 and following. Please join me now in our opening time of praise.
name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, this last week in my readings, I came across just a short, simple, but stunning statement. It said, what if, would happen if we would treat sin like we treat the coronavirus? When it comes to the coronavirus, you and I know that right now there are scientists and medical professionals going mad trying to figure out a cure or remedy because they know that when it comes to this disease, it's serious. And at the same time, all of us are doing our part by practicing social distancing. But there is something far more sinister and serious than coronavirus, and that's sin. Sin causes us to do things that we know are wrong. Sin prevents us from doing the right things sometimes that we know we should be doing. And when it comes to sin, if we don't deal with it, it continues to escalate and it can lead to spiritual sickness and weakness and eventually spiritual death. So let's take a time right now to silently confess our sins, where we've fallen short, where we've crossed the line and missed the mark of God's perfect holy will for our lives. Let's do that together right now to our Lord. Well, do I ever have good news to share with you? Again and again throughout the Bible, God refers to himself as being holy. We can't make ourselves holy, but through faith in Christ, you know the amazing gift that we receive through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Because of his perfect life lived in our place, because he paid the full price for all of our unholy actions and thoughts and deeds, because he rose triumphantly from the, the grave, as you and I trust in him, we are fully forgiven. We're made holy in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, let's take a look at two sections from God's Word today. First of all, from Isaiah chapter 6. This is one of those sections that really highlights the holiness of our Lord. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, which are a type of angel, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth, and he said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Well, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. Our second reading for today is from God's New Testament Word. We're going to be looking again at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 and following, and this will serve as the text for today's message. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. As we say that the words of the Apostles' Creed, again and again we 
in that third article we say, I believe in the Holy Spirit, I believe in the Holy Christian Church. Holy Spirit gathers us in a holy community called the church. But remember, holiness is won for us by Jesus and given to us powerfully through the Holy Spirit. Let's profess these words together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the community of saints, and the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Yeah. 
this hallelujah to the King. We'll sing an endless hallelujah to the King. Heavenly Father, we ask today that as we hear your word, that your Holy Spirit is going to increase our holiness, cause the fullness of Jesus to be developed within us throughout our life as we spend time daily with you in your word. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. All of us would agree that we're living in unusual times. Some have called this the age of anxiety. Patience is in short supply everywhere. And perhaps this anonymous editorial titled The Paradox of Our Time best summarizes our world today. The paradox of our time in history is that we have taller buildings but shorter tempers, wider freeways but narrower viewpoints. We spend more but have less. We buy more but enjoy it less. We have bigger houses and smaller families, more conveniences, but less time. We have more degrees, but less sense, more experts, but more problems, more medicine, but less wellness, higher incomes, but lower morals. We drink too much, spend too recklessly, laugh too little, drive too fast, stay up too late and watch too much TV. We talk too much, love too seldom, get too angry too quickly, and hate too often. We've added years to life, but not life to years. We've been all the way to the moon and back, but have trouble crossing the street to meet the new neighbor. We have conquered outer space, but not inner space. I especially am drawn to that last sentence. We have conquered outer space, but not inner space. And it's true, isn't it? Clearly, civilization has come in a tremendous way in a short amount of time. The engine of innovation and human progress is humming right along. Everything we build today is bigger, stronger, faster. But when it comes to inner space, that's an entirely different issue. We're not even close to conquering that. I mean, the human heart is as unruly as ever. Yet notice what God demands of us according to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. Straightforward, be holy because I am holy. These words couldn't be clear, but the whole concept of holiness, well, sometimes that's mysterious for us to understand even as Christians. Simply stated, holiness is the essence, it's the heart and the core of who God is. It's his supreme attribute or characteristic. Now, throughout the Bible, God reveals himself as loving, just, good, faithful, changeless, all-knowing, and all-powerful. But God chooses one particular word, holiness, to describe himself more than any other. Keep in mind that the ancient Hebrew language didn't emphasize or accentuate words like we do today by underlying, underlying or making them bold or by italicizing words. Instead, in the ancient world, the authors highlighted words by repeating them. So for example, think about all the times in the gospel where Jesus will, will repeat words right before he gives in a tremendously important teaching. So many times he would say things like, truly, truly, or verily, verily, I say to you, and then he would roll out some profound statement. However, very seldom is a word repeated three times in the Bible, and this never happens with any attribute of God except for one, and you can guess it, holiness. Think of it this way. God is all-loving and all-powerful, but the heavenly angels gathered around the throne aren't continually singing loving, 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 or powerful, powerful, powerful is the Lord God Almighty. No, Revelation chapter 4 verse 8 says that these angels around the throne are continuously saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was 
and is to come. Why are they saying holy, holy, holy? Because God's holiness is the crown of all that he is. Well, what does the word holy mean? Well, there are basically two definitions. First of all, holy means distinct, unique, set apart. So when the Bible says that God is holy, it means that he's incomparable, matchless. He's unlike any other being. God doesn't conform to a holy standard. He is the standard. God isn't some supersized version of you or me. No, he's in a class all by himself, and he answers to no one. Secondly, the word holy also means absolutely pure. Look at what 1 John chapter 1 de declares about God. In him there is no darkness at all. Or how about Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13? It says of God, your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. So God is infinitely perfect, never errs, and he hates and can't tolerate sin. And in order to dwell in God's presence, one must be holy. Now that was just demonstrated perfectly when God immediately evicted Lucifer and the angels who had sinned from heaven and prepared a place just for them, separated from his presence. So how does this relate to us today? Well, look at what Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14 says. Without holiness, no one will see God. So only holy people get to see God. Unholy people will never lay eyes on him. And God's standard of holiness is absolute perfection. Look at what King David wrote about this in Psalm 24. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts. Yikes. If that's true, what hope do I have? I don't know about you, but my hands certainly aren't clean, and my heart, it isn't pure, and I've totally missed the bullseye of God's perfection more often than I care to count or think about. Instead, my days are riddled with sin. My heart is attracted to sin. My mind too often is justifying and rationalizing sin. I'm so bent towards sin and its ways, I often don't even see sin in myself. In summary, I'm a living, breathing contradiction of God's holy character, and the same is true of you. This presents an impassable barrier for fallen humanity because what God requires of us, we simply cannot attain. And there's no hope whatsoever that we could ever obtain the perfect holiness that God requires of each of us. And until you and I grasp just how doomed and condemned we are apart from Jesus, we will never appreciate the priceless value of the gospel. Simply put, our extreme condition demanded an extreme remedy. How far was God willing to go in order to save us from our hopeless dilemma? Well, it's really beyond comprehension. But look at what God's word says about this, again, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. He, Jesus, was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Some people think that when Adam and Eve sinned, God said, oops, I didn't see that coming, as if the arrival of Jesus was an afterthought in God's original plan. But just the opposite is true. As we just read, before God created the universe, including Adam and Eve, he already knew that they were going to sin and bring brokenness, bondage, and devastation into this world. So in the councils of eternity, God the Father says to God the Son, you must go to the earth to save my beloved people from their sins. And so redemption and salvation were on God's hearts long before sin entered the world. So how can a holy God who must judge and punish every sin keep his integrity and still save you and me? 
Well, once again, look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. You know that it wasn't with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed or bought back from the empty way of life, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. What God's holiness demanded, his grace provided in Jesus Christ our Lord. Let me say that again. What God's holiness demanded, his grace provided in Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus took on flesh, stepped into this holy world, and took upon himself the white hot heat of God's holy revulsion towards sin on Calvary's cross. My sin, your sin, was put on Christ. And in that moment when Jesus paid the full penalty for our sin with his blood, suffering, and death, something wonderful happened. After rising from the dead, Jesus took all his holiness and wove it into a suit of clothes and freely offered it to you and to me. And in that moment, when we were baptized, when we received the gift of faith in the Savior Jesus, his perfect holiness and righteousness were credited to us. Look at how Isaiah 61 verse 10 describes this perfectly. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in God and my God. Why? For he has clothed me with garments of salvation and covered me with a robe of righteousness. Subsequently, as followers of Christ, we walk around today wearing his holiness. And as the Heavenly Father looks down at you and me from above, he doesn't see our sins. Instead, he sees us covered with the holiness of our blessed Savior who lived, died, and rose again for us. And until we get to heaven, the Holy Spirit's going to constantly attempt to shape and mold us more and more into the image of Christ and his holy standard. That's the greatest news that I could possibly share with you today. But so what? How does that truth that we have been covered with Jesus' holiness impact the way that we live today? Well, that's what 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 and following are all about. Peter lists four ways in our text that Jesus' holiness works in us and through us today. First of all, number one, we establish a new mindset. Look at how verse 13 says this in summary. Peter writes, prepare your minds for action. The literal translation of those words right there is gird up the loins of your mind. Well, what in the world does that mean? Well, in the first century, the men would wear, obviously, these long flowing robes with a belt around their waist. And whenever they got ready to do some really hard labor or to go into battle, they would shorten their robes by tucking them into their belts. And this made it far easier for them to move quickly. And that was called girding up the loins. When an equivalent expression today would be saying something like this, chop, chop. Take off your coat, roll up your sleeves, let's get to work. In other words, Peter is saying, don't let your mind get fat, lazy, and undisciplined. Why? Because when we don't carefully monitor what we read, watch, and listen to, it's easy for our minds to start wandering and ruminating over unwholesome thoughts. Those things then eventually turn into sinful actions. So it is with anger, bitterness, impatience, lust, greed, and every other sin. Since all problems start right here between our ears, growing in Christ-like holiness means setting our minds on things above. Secondly, how does being covered with Christ's holiness, wearing that robe of righteousness, impact the way we live? Well, we have a new focus. Peter's next instruction is so, so simple. Be self-controlled. Well, what does that mean? Well, other translations write it, be sober-minded or be morally alert and disciplined. In other words, the more we remember who we are in Christ, 
deters things from clouding our moral and spiritual judgment, from lowering our standards, or from causing us to compromise our values. Let me put it this way. There are certain friendships we should avoid. There are certain books we shouldn't read. There are some TV shows and movies we shouldn't watch. There are some internet sites we shouldn't visit. There are some songs we shouldn't listen to. And there are some places we shouldn't go. There are some people we shouldn't date. There are some jobs we shouldn't have. And there are some habits we need to break. The Holy Spirit will tug and weigh in our consciences whenever we're in situations or settings that are spiritually unwholesome. He does this all the time. And as long as we're listening to his clear guidance and feeding ourselves daily with God's word, we'll be on the path of Christ-like holiness. Third, how does being covered with Jesus' holiness impact the way we live today? Well, we have a new goal. Notice again how Peter describes this at the end of verse 13. Set your hope fully. Set your hope fully on what? On the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. So all of us set our hope on something. Students set their hope on graduating. Brides set their hope on their wedding day. A candidate sets his hope on winning the election. Peter reminds us here to keep our eyes on the ultimate prize when Jesus will bodily return again. The Christian life at times is hard. It's long. It's discouraging. You know that. And if we lose sight of Christ's second coming, it's far easier to lose that motivation for Christian living. But as long as the second coming of Jesus is squarely in our minds and in our view, well, we'll have zeal to share the gospel. We'll have more courage to face suffering. We'll have more strength to turn away from the empty fads of this broken world. On Judgment Day, all of us are going to give an account to Jesus of how we've used the talents and gifts that he entrusted to us. This will change the way that we live today. The choices we make, the friends we keep, the words we speak, and the path that we follow. Peter says, keep your eyes on the goal. Finally, how does being covered with Christ's holiness impact the way that we live today? We have a new standard of conduct. In verse 15 of chapter 1, notice what Peter writes. Just as he, Jesus, who called you is holy... So be holy in all that you do in every department of your life. We know God is holy. We know that we're his children. So our family resemblance should be increasing throughout our lifetime. Our outward character to the world demonstrates the inner change that Christ's love and forgiveness are powerfully nurturing within us each day. Frankly, because Jesus lived and died for you and me, there's no sacrifice that's too great for us to make for him. We want to be so much like God that our holiness is unmistakable and the world begins to change around us. Let's pray. You know, Jesus, when it comes to the topic of holiness... It's so easy to hear a sermon like this and say, well, I'm sure glad so-and-so heard this because why wow, did they ever need to hear that message? But today's sermon calls all of us to do some soul searching. We all have a long way to go when it comes to Christ-like holiness. So Holy Spirit, help us conquer our inner space. Keep filling us with the fullness of Jesus. Pour his love and gospel forgiveness into our hearts through your powerful word. And most of all, Jesus, thank you for covering us with your perfect holiness through faith in you, our Savior. Jesus, be our all in all in every part of our life, so that not only will we be changed by your holiness, but so also will the world around us. Lord, we lift up all kinds of people who are weighing on our hearts today, 
whether they're struggling physically, emotionally, financially, relationally, or spiritually, hear us now as we lift up these individuals in our hearts to you. Grant them your healing and use us, Lord, in the process of being your caregivers. And Lord, we pray for Trina Truhan and her family at the tragic death of her uncle Daniel. We pray for all others who are mourning today, Lord. Continue to point out that you are the resurrection and the life. Thank you that no matter what's happening in our lives and the world around us, we all are more than conquerors. We win before tough situations come our way because of your forgiveness, because of your empty tomb, because of your spirit working powerfully in and through us today. Hear us as we lift up all of these various petitions to you, knowing that we can trust fully, confidently in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Let's take a look at this uh, awesome video now that, uh, again, will point out the blessings of glorious, faithful moms. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your special gift of mothers. Thank you for moms who let their children know without a doubt that they are loved, and for children who return that love. Thank you for mothers who daily foster the faith of their children. Thank you for moms who play with us, train us, nurture us, feed us, listen to us, and try to understand us. Guide them with your grace, protect them with your presence, increase their faith, and give them the wisdom they need to follow your will. Holy Spirit, comfort mothers who are sad and sorrowful over children who have died, are ill, or estranged from their families. Lord, we ask that you would give peace to those who are unable to have children. Remind them always that Jesus is our all in all. Lord, for moms who have died or are separated from us by distance, thank you for the good memories of them that flood our minds. Empower each of us to honor our parents always with a spirit of profound respect. We thank you, Lord, for life and for mom. Hear us now as we pray together the prayer that you have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Before you close 
close your eyes to sleep. I have a promise still to keep as I hold you in my arms. I pray your little frame grows strong and that faith takes home while you young this is my prayer for you hold my hand I'll teach you the way to go through the joys through the tears the journey of these years may you trust him till May you trust him till the end. This world is not as it should be. But the Savior opens eyes to see all that's beautiful and true. Oh, may his light fill all and the jewel of wisdom crown your heart this is my prayer for you hold my hand i'll teach you the way to go through the joys faithful till the end you will travel where my arms won't reach as the road will rise to lead your feet on a journey of your own. May my mistakes not hinder you, but his grace remain and guide you through. This is my prayer for you. Take his hand. This will be my prayer for you. Mm -hmm. Father, hear my ceaseless prayer. Oh, keep them in your care. Again today, thanks for worshiping with us. When it comes to announcements, really the only thing that we want to continue to highlight is that come to us, call us, contact us if you want the Lord's Supper. Pastor Craig and I would love to give that to you privately either here at church or call us. We'll come and give you the Lord's Supper at your home and we'll keep watching. We'll see what Governor Walls' mandate is. Maybe we can be soon gathering together as a congregation. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his perfect peace. Amen. For our sending words today, let's look at these words from God's word. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. 
Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Covered with and reflecting Christ's holiness through every aspect of our life, let us go in peace and serve the Lord. Strong name of Jesus by the prayer. 